A miserable day for almost anyone who had to be outside. Whether you were walking or driving, you probably got soaked as significant rainfall and strong winds swept across the GTA. Good evening. You can see a live look outside of the conditions, conditions that haven't been great all day. Mm -hmm. The special weather statement remains in effect tonight. Environment Canada warning of the continued potential for heavy rain as well as wet snow. CTV's Janice Golding has been out in the rain all day and we're wiping the lens just in time for the six o'clock news. She joins us now. Hey, Janice. Hi, Michelle. As you can tell, this has not been a good hair day. It has been a wet, wild day in the GTA with Environment Canada issuing a special weather advisory at about heavy rain that could turn to snow tonight or overnight. They say April showers bring May flowers, but a spring storm also brought strong winds with gusts up to 80 kilometers an hour, knocking down trees and knocking off hats. The weather is lovely, but the wind is very harsh. My umbrella just broke off and I have to travel to Scarborough right now. A miserable morning commute with Environment Canada forecasting up to 40 millimeters of rain. The wet, windy weather, no fun for waterlogged workers. Standing out here for an hour and a half of the flow and just getting totally soaked is uh, less than ideal. Of course, being dressed for success can help. Lovely. I dressed for it. I got an umbrella. I'm all good to go. It's a job where you got to be out in all weather, so you just buy the appropriate gear and look super cool. <laughs> Still, as this dog walker explains, no amount of preparation can prevent what comes with wet dog. If they're like a water dog, like a retriever, this is their best day. And yeah, my car smells terrible. The early spring storm first struck late Tuesday afternoon, the tail end of a Colorado low that's impacting southern Ontario. You know, I spent four years living in British Columbia. I moved here because I thought it would be better. The winds eased later in the day, but temperatures also started dropping. You know, when I was a child, I used to uh, take a bath under the rain, so it reminds me of my childhood days. Yeah, but I bet you it was warmer where you were taking a bath in the rain. <laughs> yeah. This when is not rain bathing rain. in the rain kind of weather. <laughs> the steady stream of rain causing police to warn residents to stay away from streams, rivers and shorelines due to flooding risks. Now, periods of wet snow are expected across the GTA and much of southern Ontario overnight with wet snow and flurries lingering into the morning. So you should be careful driving to work tomorrow. Reporting live, I'm Janice Golding. Now back to Michelle. Thank you, Janice. And let's take a live look at the roads tonight from Pickering. Yes, you'll need those wipers going. Not a great drive for commuters, both heading to work and driving home. The heavy rain at times prompting some to pull over. Ah, yes, it is spring. Jessica Smith is here to talk about the current conditions. We see that it's raining this hour. Give us a sense of what's happening. So we're in that kind of sweet spot where things are going to start to transition over to that wet snow as temperatures drop as we head in towards the evening. It's been steady, though, throughout the day. Still a breezy easterly wind. Those gusts between 50 and 60 kilometers an hour still in some areas. We're still under that special weather statement. It really hasn't changed at all as we made our way throughout the day today. For us here in the city, as of, say, 7 a.m., it was about 15 millimeters already. We've just seen steady rain throughout the day so that 40 millimeter range is very very likely by the time this is all said and done the further east you go the cooler it is we're looking at more of a snow event now as we get in towards the rest of our evening things are going to get a little cooler we're sitting at five right now but the low tonight is just closer to seasonal but as we see this kind of intersection of cold air cool air and warm air aloft it just creates this mess that is going to sit over us as we kind of wrap up the day sitting at five right now here in the city we're at eight through windsor three through kingston two in ottawa and as we head through the evening that rain turns into some mixing for us other communities further east getting some pretty significant snow all those details coming up right now i'll send things back over to nathan thank you jess still to come tonight taiwan is rocked by the strongest earthquake to hit the island in a quarter century the latest on the damage and how canada has offered to help Back here at home, testimony continued at the trial of Umar Zamir. He is the man accused in the death of Toronto Police Constable Jeffrey Northrup. Today, jurors heard from an accident reconstructionist who testified how he believes the incident unfolded. CTV John Woodward was in court and joins us live tonight with the latest. John. Nathan, so much has been made at this trial of the precise movements of Umar Zamir's BMW. Police officers have testified it hit uh, Constable Northrup head on, but uh, Umar Zamir's wife has testified she didn't see anything like that, saying it was a tragic accident. Now we're moving from the witness testimony to the forensics uh, with that collision reconstructionist saying that crash happened when the vehicle was moving backwards. 
This video of the crash scene was created by a Toronto police collision reconstructionist using a laser scan. The three-dimensional view of the City Hall Parkade, where Constable Jeff Northrup was struck down by a BMW driven by Umar Zamir. And another video of the scene where that BMW was stopped as plainclothes officers slammed their vehicle into Zamir's, arrested him at gunpoint, his pregnant wife and child in the car. Detective Sergeant Jeff Bassingthwaite took the stand to explain how he pieced together the final moments using clues from the physical evidence at the scene and a grainy video that shows only a piece of the tragedy. So far, the trial has heard from three officers who were at the parkade on Canada Day 2021 with Northrop, including his partner Lisa Forbes, all in plain clothes as they searched for a stabbing suspect. They testified Northrop was hit head-on by the BMW, even as he identified himself as an officer showing his badge. Meanwhile, Zamir's wife, Ida Sheikh, testified the entire family was downtown for Canada Day and thought they were being attacked or robbed in a chaotic scene and fled. She testified she never saw the car hit Northrop, though she did feel a bump. Bassingthwaite said in his opinion Northrop was first hit when the BMW backed up. He told the court as the vehicle turned, its front end gets further out than the back end of the vehicle. And as a result, the pedestrian, Jeff Northrop, was struck by the front left fender in the area of the wheel as the wheel was reversing and subsequently he was knocked down. Then Northrop was likely already on the ground as the car accelerated forward, he said. All of Bassingthwaite's expert evidence was introduced by the Crown attorney, who asked if Bassingthwaite considered the collision avoidable. He said yes. Bassingthwaite also referred to other evidence that's been entered, including the placement of uh, fingerprints on the vehicle, including that prints that matched to, uh, to Northrop, as well as a single frame of that very grainy video, which we're not going to show you, but I can tell you that it shows an unidentified object lying down in front of the car. Reporting live from 361 University, I'm John Woodward. Back to you. Thank you, John. North of the city, police are scouring a Richmond Hill neighborhood for signs of a missing 49-year-old man. Kwok Wei Lung's family says they haven't been able to reach him since Sunday night when he left his home on Mallory Street on foot. The home is near Leslie and Elgin Mills. York Regional Police set up a command post nearby as they've ramped up ground searches over the last day. Investigators are asking anybody with information to get in touch. Toronto police are searching for this man in connection with a random assault on the subway on March 6th. At around noon, they say he attacked someone he did not know, punching them in the face. It happened on the eastbound platform of Islington Station. He's been identified as 42-year-old Jeffrey Lovell of Toronto. If you see him, police say call 911 and do not approach. And the search is on for a trio of robbery suspects after an incident caught on camera in Vaughan last week. The York Regional Police holdup unit shared this video from March 27th at around 4 p.m. It happened not far from the 407 and Pine Valley Road. Police say two men got out of a vehicle and threatened to shoot a woman if she didn't hand over cash. They then fled. While the driver went unseen, police shared images of two suspects and a suspect vehicle described as a newer model black BMW 3. There's been a major bust of stolen vehicles. Nearly 600 have been recovered in Montreal, about three quarters of them from Ontario. As our intelligence indicated, the vast majority of stolen, recovered stolen vehicles, more than 430, were taken from the greater Toronto area. The primary vehicles being targeted were newer vehicles, including high-end pickup trucks and SUVs. These vehicles were connected to various types of violent vehicle crimes, including carjackings and home invasions. A large number of the vehicles taken in Ontario were to be shipped overseas via the Port of Montreal. The operation was a joint effort involving the Canada Border Services Agency and police services in Ontario and Quebec. Since December of last year, 390 containers were opened, resulting in the discovery of 598 stolen vehicles. They have a potential value of $34.5 million. Police say the vehicles were headed to markets in Asia, Europe, Africa, the Middle East, and South America. Still to come tonight, the driver of this Lamborghini is facing charges after an accident in Vancouver. Police say the car is a write-off and the driver was just 13 years old. Details coming up. March was a slower month for home sales compared to last year. The Toronto Regional Real Estate Board says more than 6,500 resales took place 
down 4.5 percent from 2023. The average selling price creeped up more than 1 percent to $1.12 million. New listings are up 15 percent, something trebling to homeowners expecting better market conditions in the spring. Analysts say if borrowing costs drop, those new listings will be absorbed by the market and tighter market conditions will return. The federal government is offering another multi-billion dollar glimpse of what's in the upcoming budget. The April 16th document will include a $15 billion top-up to the Apartment Construction Loan Program. Ottawa says that will help build at least 131,000 new apartments within the next decade. The program is also being altered to extend loan terms and expand financing to include housing for students and seniors. The Trudeau Liberals and the Ford government are at odds on housing in the province. While both say they want to get new units built, they've been struggling to agree on a plan. CTV's Raheem Ladani has been following this story and joins us live with more. Raheem. Nathan and Michelle, the province now has nine months to get on board with the federal government's housing plan. But as of today, it is not budging on its stance with new money at stake. While the federal government is promising billions of new dollars for housing across the country, Ontario may be strapped without the cash because Premier Ford doesn't like the plan. The difference between ourselves and the federal government, and I, I want to work with them, I am working with them on a lot of different issues uh, on a daily basis, uh, I don't believe in forcing municipalities. One of the conditions to access the funds continues to be that provinces must require municipalities to allow higher density housing, including fourplexes. In the GTA on Wednesday, the Prime Minister said if that doesn't happen, he'll bypass the Premier. Ideally, we work with the province. If not, uh, I know uh, Olivia has always t already told me, hey, send the extra money to Toronto, we'll build more homes. Toronto's mayor says her willingness to change previous construction barriers is already paying dividends. In Toronto, we exceeded our provincial housing targets by 51 percent. At stake is the Federal Canada Housing Infrastructure Fund, which will provide $6 billion to tackle the housing crisis. Reacting to stipulations for funding, Ontario's housing minister says... We will wait to see more details from the federal government and are open to collaboration. However, we know that local municipalities know their communities best and don't believe in forcing them to build where it doesn't make sense. The back and forth prompting others to urge the premier to bend to the rules. Given the crisis that we have, we need all tools at the table and allowing increased density in some of the neighborhoods that are seeing a population decrease in many cases. And again, nobody's forcing anything. As a deadline for the feds and province to find common ground looms closer. Other municipalities, including Brampton, are open to fourplexes. The city tells me while not all lots lend themselves to it, it has made an agreement with the federal government to permit fourplexes along specific transit corridors within the next three years. Reporting live, I'm Raheem Ladani. Nathan, I'll send it back to you. Thank you, Raheem. The inquiry into foreign interference heard more today from former MPs who say they were targets of China. But the star witness was former Conservative leader Aaron O'Toole, who shed more light on the extent of meddling in several ridings in the 2021 election. CTV's Judy Trin picks up the story. Aaron O'Toole says China targeted his party in the 2021 federal election because of its policies. Our positions on human rights issues, uh, the Uyghurs in particular, but also Hong Kong and Tibet, um, our, our positions were much stronger, and I, I believe reflected our values and interests as a, as a country better than the policies of Mr. Trudeau. I can understand where uh, someone who lost an election is trying to look for reasons uh, other than themselves why they might have lost an election. Declassified documents show that the Chinese Communist Party may have been working to discourage voting for the Conservatives and spreading a narrative that Aaron O'Toole wanted to break diplomatic ties with China. Most of the disinformation was being spread on Chinese social media app WeChat. There are 600,000 WeChat users just in British Columbia and hundreds of thousands more across Canada. They're getting almost all of their information from channels that cannot be trusted. O'Toole estimates foreign interference contributed to the loss of as many as nine Conservative seats, including Kenny Chu's. Chu said constituents who supported him in previous elections suddenly turned on him. We didn't bother asking for a long time because she says she's not going to vote for us. Um, 
because we hate uh, China, because we hate them. O'Toole said if he had a do-over, he would have hired more Cantonese and Mandarin-speaking staff so they could focus on WeChat instead of Silicon Valley apps like Facebook and Twitter. Judy Trin, CTV News, Ottawa. The Taiwanese government says the top priority right now is rescuing people after an earthquake struck the country today, killing nine people and injuring more than 1,000 others. This news anchor managed to keep her composure when the 7.2 magnitude quake happened just before 8 a.m. local time. It hit off the sparsely populated east coast, damaging buildings, roads, bridges and tunnels. The earthquake also set off at least 24 landslides. Two Canadians are among 12 people stuck in a national park, Gorge, after rock slides hit. More than 50 aftershocks were recorded in the capital, Taipei, about 150 kilometers away. Most power has now been restored in the area. Today, Prime Minister Trudeau said Canada is ready to help if needed. Canada stands ready to provide support and have reached out to Taiwanese officials. We're also engaging to make sure affected Canadians have the support they need. It was the strongest earthquake to strike Taiwan in 25 years. The country is regularly jolted by quakes, and its population is among the best prepared for them. The United States says it wants a swift investigation into the attack that killed seven aid workers in Gaza, including a Canadian. Three British nationals, an Australian, a Polish national, and a Palestinian were also killed. The World Central Kitchen Convoy was hit this week shortly after the workers oversaw the unloading of food brought to Gaza by sea. Israel expressed sorrow over the incident and called it unintentional. Today, the U.S. said whatever the reason that led to this tragedy, it is unacceptable. Canada's foreign affairs minister also demanded accountability. I've reached out last night to Israel Katz, my uh, Israeli counterpart on this very issue. Israel needs to respect international humanitarian law, and we will make sure that that is the case. The founder of the charity says there was clear communication with the Israeli military and it knew of the aid workers' movements in what it says was a de-conflicting zone. Chef Jose Andreas points out the convoy was clearly marked and it was very clear who they were and what they were doing. The United Nations has now suspended movements at night in Gaza for at least 48 hours. A GoFundMe page has been launched to raise money for a funeral and a trust fund for the son of a Canadian aid worker. 33-year-old Jacob Flickinger was a military veteran from Quebec. In a Facebook post, his father, John, said his son's death is a heartbreaking tragedy, but he died doing what he loved. The dual Canadian and U.S. citizen had worked for World Central Kitchen in Gaza since early March. Last fall, he traveled with the charity to Mexico to provide food after Hurricane Otis. In Jerusalem, protesters disrupted the Israeli parliament today. They called on officials to do more to free the remaining hostages being held by Hamas. The demonstrators smeared paint on the partition between the visitors' gallery and the parliament floor while chanting now at lawmakers. The group was eventually escorted out of the gallery. Israel estimates 130 people are still being held captive in Gaza. Parts of the U.S. received some severe weather today. A tornado touched down in Rockdale County, Georgia this morning before tracking north. Several states have been dealing with a variety of conditions. A major spring storm is expected to drop more than a foot of snow in New England today. And heavy rains were forecast on the east coast. At least one death is blamed on the weather. Forecasters also said heavy, wet snow would persist across Wisconsin and upper Michigan into tomorrow. He wasn't hurt, but a 13-year-old boy is facing charges after smashing up a Lamborghini in B.C. West Vancouver police were called about a single vehicle crash on the Trans-Canada Highway at around 11 p.m. last Monday. When they arrived, nobody was in the car, which was abandoned in a ditch. Officers said they conducted an exhaustive search to find who was in this vehicle. They eventually located the youth who had decided to take the car for a drive with a friend. In L.A., the Duchess of Sussex paid a surprise visit to a children's hospital. Her great-great-aunt Rose was a true dynamo who'd worked building airplanes a long time ago. Megan read from one of her favorite books. 
Her visit last month was part of an annual campaign that raises money for the hospital. There was also a reading program that promotes literacy. It gives families at the hospital more than 65,000 books each year. Coming up, systems restored at Toronto hospitals after a code gray forced appointment and service delays. Insight into the outage and the ensuing impact on patients. As temperatures drop as we head into the day tomorrow, we're looking at a blast of a bit of a wintry mix. We get a wet snow as we head throughout our Thursday, so sending the kids off to school. A few extra layers are probably necessary because not only is it cooler, but we also still have to contend with a really breezy wind as we head into the day tomorrow. Coming up, I'll have a full look at your language forecast. And stay with us. We've got another full night of great shows for you right here on CTV. An added headache for patients and staff across the University Health Network today. Computer and communication systems went down, causing a code gray at the hospital. As CTV's Beth McDonnell reports, an investigation is now underway into what caused the outage. Computers and communication networks are key to ensuring hospitals run smoothly. Around 5 in the morning on Hospital Row, those systems went down in what's called a code gray at University Health Network, forcing facilities to delay some appointments. And in some very rare cases, uh, appointments and procedures have had to be postponed. We've also had to uh, postpone a couple of surgical procedures just out of an abundance of caution. The more than seven hour long outage affected digital patient records and the patient portal at Toronto General, Toronto Western, Toronto Rehab and Princess Margaret Cancer Centre. Thousands of patients visit these hospitals every day, and when it came to cancellations, some traveling from out of town had better luck than others. They can't do the procedure. The x-ray machines are down. Everything's down. It's a computer. We had a choice of going home or coming down. We decided to come down, and they processed us with like no delay, and uh, she's getting the MRI, so it's wow. UHN's website was also down for a time, hampering its ability to get news about the outage out. Officials say clinics called patients to notify them of delays, while some learned about the disruption at the hospital. Down no, we just got uh, reports over the PA system that the systems were down, but we didn't experience any, any delays at all. UHN says the outage wasn't a cyber attack, quickly ruling it out using cyber tools, and was related to infrastructure. The exact cause still to be determined an interruption that required staff going back to the basics. We have paper order systems, we have paper requisitions and, uh, and paper note taking and record keeping. At 1245 in the afternoon, all health information systems were restored. Still, UHN says patients may experience delays for the rest of the day to clear backlogs. Beth McDonnell, CTV News. Transit advocacy group TTC Riders has launched a complaint to Toronto's Auditor General relating to last year's Scarborough RT derailment. On July 24th, a train car on the now former Line 3 derailed near Ellesmere Station. Bolts holding down power rails had come loose, something the TTC says was found to be unrelated to maintenance. Advocates are calling on the Auditor General to investigate the steps the TTC had taken in response to a consultant's advice on track D defects and how they're handled. We don't have a lot of trust in, you know, whether the TTC did everything it could to keep the RT um, safe and, um, and well maintained. And also we have questions about what's going on on the TTC right now, because on March 1st, there was a, a cracked switch rail discovered overnight. Um, there are unprecedented um, number of reduced speed zones introduced this winter. So this raises alarm bells for us. The incident prompted the early permanent closure of line three. TTC Chair Jamal Myers says he looks forward to discussing the reports on the derailment at the board meeting next week. And he said in a statement, the TTC board, the City of Toronto and TTC take the safety and reliability of public transit seriously, which is why the 2024 budget for the TTC included an increase in funding towards state of good repair, as well as a fully funded Scarborough RT busway. Collectively, we remain committed to providing a safe, comfortable and reliable service of to TTC customers, which keeps our city moving. Voters in two Ontario ridings are set to go to the polls next month. This follows the resignations from the legislature of former PC cabinet ministers Monty McNaughton and Parm Gill. Provincial by-elections will take place in their ridings, Lambton, Kent, Middlesex and Milton, with voting day scheduled for May 2nd. It's also possible to vote early or vote by mail. Full details and registration deadlines are at elections.on.ca. 
Ontario's Superior Court has struck down parts of the province's panhandling law. Critics launched a constitutional challenge of the Safe Streets Act implemented by the Harris government in 1999. It prohibits soliciting in an aggressive manner or to a captive audience, including people on public transit. Fair Change Legal Clinic argued the law violated charter rights and criminalized those in need. The Superior Court judge agreed in part, but left in place rules around threats of physical harm and walking onto the street to ask drivers for money. The Ministry of the Attorney General said it wouldn't comment on the matter during the appeal period. All right, let's talk about that forecast. And it's been coming down for quite a bit, and it's you know, pooling, flooding in some areas, some concerns about this weather. Mm -hmm. Do you think this qualifies as a washout day? Yeah. Absolutely. Yes, I didn't wash my car for a reason, as we kind yeah. of get ready for today. The rain has just been consistent. Really, there's nowhere for the water to go. The ground is pretty saturated from the snow we had a little while back, the rain that followed it. So really, the ponding and pooling has only gotten progressively worse out there on the road. So just be careful as you head out this evening. As we make our way through the overnight, that's when the transition takes place to that cooler air and that transition to more of a wet snow. So we're not looking at a measurable amount per se, but it doesn't mean it changes how you drive out there on the roads. It is going to be a little bit messy tonight. Weather is brought to you by Train, the most reliable heating and cooling brand. It's hard to stop a train. We're starting to see a little fog build up there as well as we see that transition between, you know, the the cooler air aloft and, and the warmer ground below. And things just taking place so rapidly as we see temperatures drop. Really, it is just back towards a much more seasonal mark. But after having a relatively warm day today and yesterday, we're seeing a transition start to take place as we head into the evening. We're sitting at four degrees right now here in the city. Seven through Windsor, four in Sault Ste. Marie, five up in Moosonee. Generally across the province, it's still relatively mild. Heading into this evening, though, we do dip down two seasonal or just below in many cases. We'll be at two here in the city. We should be at one, so we're kind of hovering around that mark. As we hit through London, we're pretty much spot on for where we should be, and really we're within a degree or two of the seasonal norms. Into the day tomorrow, that cooler air not going anywhere, and that easterly wind becomes northeasterly, that little bit of a northerly flow just adds to that chance of mixing. Temperature-wise, we should be around nine. We're nowhere near that. Really right across the board, we're hovering between about the freezing mark and about five degrees for the most part. The bulk of the Colorado low is going to push past us and start to affect southern portions of Quebec, but behind it, a few secondary systems are going to sit through. We have some occluded fronts. Those are the purple lines there. So you have cold air pushing out cool air and you have warm air aloft and that, that intersection is just really messy weather. It's just going to be gross, to be honest, for the next couple of days. Uh, Temperature-wise, as we head through the evening, that transition takes place. So the flurries, the heavier flurries are towards Bancroft, out towards Ottawa. For us here in the GTA through the downtown core, following more as a wet snow. So maybe two centimeters, but with the rain in it, it quite literally dampens uh, any of those numbers. As we get into tomorrow morning, a little drier as we get things started, but as we head in towards the afternoon, we start to see that mixing take place again. So it comes in pockets as we head throughout the day tomorrow. So not nearly as steady as it was today. Getting into our Friday, still watching for the chance of it. Again, a dry enough morning. As we get into the afternoon, we see temperatures start to rise. So the leftover precipitation falls back as rain as we head in towards the second half of the day. We've already seen a significant amount. By the time we get in towards the end of the day Thursday, we're looking at another five millimeters, but in total, we're still waiting on some numbers, but that close to 40 range is not out of the realm of possibility. Out towards eastern Ontario through Ottawa, they're looking at the potential of that kind of 30 centimeter range when it comes to the snow. So they're seeing the heavier amounts in the way of snowfall as opposed to rain. Temperature wise, again, it is cool tomorrow. It's going to be a little fresh out there. Extra layers are going to be a good idea. Getting into Friday, we start to climb back towards the seasonal mark. It's really not until we get into Saturday and Sunday that things return to seasonal and then above. Everybody's watching that Monday forecast, of course, for the eclipse. It is going to be a little bit cloudy out there. We're looking at just the transitional clouds, not, nothing really significant. It should be okay for viewing the eclipse, obviously, with the right eyewear. Getting into the evening, we are watching for the risk of maybe a light shower that carries us into our Tuesday, not an all-over, all-day type of rain event. And then by the time we get to Wednesday, we're looking at the potential of 14 to 16 degrees. So after we get through Friday, things get much better. Nathan. All right. Thank you, Jess. Thanks. Also tonight, with all eyes expected on the skies to view the upcoming solar eclipse, we get expert advice on what you need to look for when looking for proper eye protection. With the solar eclipse just days away, many people are preparing to watch the celestial event safely, which means using special glasses. One of the world's leading experts on eclipse eye safety works at Waterloo University and talked to CTV's Pauline Chan about how to make sure your safety glasses are good for eclipse viewing. Another friend who 
had actually incurred uh, an eclipse burn in one of his eyes uh, uh, from looking at the sun unprotected. So, you know, those two really stick with me, but I've seen a few other people as well over the years. Dr. Ralph Chu wrote the ISO standard for eclipse viewing glasses. And while he hopes decades of educating people about eye safety have had an effect, he worries about the sheer number of people, young and old, who will be watching this guy on April 8th. The damaged retina is a... Um, uh, literal dead man walking. The the cells may be um, very badly damaged, but they continue to function normally for several hours. Chu says there's always someone who tries to sneak a bare-eyed glimpse of the sun being completely blocked by the moon. But the retina has no pain sensors, and the damage won't be seen until several hours later. And while some damage may be repaired over the following months... The fact is that there is no effective treatment for this kind of condition. What is it exactly that damages the light receptor cells of the retina? Chu says it's the blue light, similar to what you get from your computer screen, but much more more intense, causing a chemical reaction in the photoreceptors. The blue is much, much more effective at causing the damage uh, than anything else. And while the front of the eye can effectively block out some harmful UV rays, an area at the back of the eye intended to absorb excess light not being used in the visual process can start turning that light into heat. At the intracellular level, you can get enough of this absorption and heat transduction to literally boil the cell from the inside. That's why having the proper eye protection is essential. Right now, uh, and we are seeing uh, a lot of uh, fake uh, solar eclipse glasses appearing in the marketplace now as people try to make a buck. What should you look for? Number one is a direct statement that this device uh, complies with the ISO 12312-2 2015 standard. Secondly, the full name and address of the manufacturer will appear on the device somewhere. The third piece of information is um, the identity of the testing organization. You should also expect to see warning messages and instructions on how to properly use the glasses. Dr. Chu says if a piece of information is missing, an easy way to test your glasses is to use your cell phone flashlight, which is a very intense LCD source, and hold it up in front of your glasses. You should see complete darkness except for that small pinpoint of light. That probably means it's safe, but it's not a guarantee. Pauline Chan, CTV News. The first of a couple of city-run MPOX clinics was held in the city today. The vaccine was offered to eligible residents on a walk-in basis at the 519 on Church Street from 1 to 5 p.m. Another clinic will operate by appointment only from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. at Metro Hall on Saturday. MPOX is a virus that spreads primarily through close contact. Symptoms include fever, headache, muscle pain, and a rash or blisters. The vaccine is free and an OHIP card is not required for those who meet eligibility rules. As part of the provincial budget, the Ford government is providing $9 million to support design and planning for York University's new medical school in Vaughan. The development of the Vaughan Healthcare Center precinct and the York University School of Medicine will solidify Vaughan as a destination of choice for students, talent, and businesses in the health and health technology sectors. The province says the medical school will be the first in Canada to focus primarily on training family doctors. I've reached out last night to Israel Katz, my uh, Israeli counterpart on this very issue. Israel needs to respect inter... York U's medical school is expected to open in September 2028. That was the wrong clip, by the way. This school will have up to 240 undergrad seats and 293 postgrad seats once it reaches full capacity. And meanwhile, one of the most prestigious medical schools in the country is making changes to its admissions process to try to make it more equitable. The School of Medicine at Queen's University in Kingston says it will introduce a lottery system in the fall. It will allow randomly selected candidates who meet standard testing and GPA thresholds to move on to the interview stage. It's describing the lottery system as the first of its kind in Canada. The school says the changes are meant to reduce systemic barriers for low-income and diverse candidates. A major stage production has set its final performance date here in Toronto.
Mervish Productions says six, the musical will end its Canadian run on May 26. That'll mark 36 weeks in Toronto at the Princess of Wales Theatre after four in Edmonton. The story about Henry VIII's wives will have played before more than 320,000 people in that stretch. The estate of George Carlin has agreed to settle a lawsuit over a fake comedy special that apparently used AI to recreate his voice. Court documents filed Monday show podcast Dudesy agreed to permanently take down the AI special and refrain from using Carlin's image, voice or likeness in the future without express permission. Carlin's daughter Kelly said she hopes the case serves as a warning about the need for appropriate safeguards around artificial intelligence. The settlement still needs a judge's approval. Jennifer Lopez is rebranding her world tour amid reports of slow ticket sales. The singer has been promoting her This Is Me Now tour titled after her recent new album. But today Lopez posted a video adding the words the greatest hits to the tour name. Industry insiders say that could be an effort to entice longer term fans looking to hear more familiar tracks. Lopez and Live Nation didn't comment. She is set to play Scotiabank Arena in August. After several high-profile biopics of music artists over recent years, a project's in the works telling the story of Air Supply. I'm all out of love. I'm so lost without you. I know you were right. The soft rock duo of Graham Russell and Russell Hitchcock was formed in Australia in the 1970s. Their journey is set to be the focus of All Out of Love, the Air Supply story. Variety reports the film will debut in the summer of 2025 to celebrate the band's 50th anniversary. A new Matrix movie is on the way, executive produced by the film's original co-writer and co-director, Lana Wachowski. I want the truth, Neo. You're going to have to follow me. The last Matrix movie was 2021's Matrix Resurrections. Now Warner Brothers says the sci-fi franchise is expanding to a fifth title. Oscar-nominated screenwriter Drew Goddard will write and direct. There's been no word on the plot or if star Keanu Reeves will join the cast. After the break, a new chapter for Indigo. The retailer reaches an agreement to be taken private. The details in the day's business headlines in moments. Heartache and Lemonade. That's the new country EP by Blanco Brown, and he's moseying into town to talk about it on the next CP24 Breakfast. Where Toronto gets its everything every morning. Standing out here for an hour and a half in a row and just getting totally soaked is uh, less than ideal. Updating our top stories, the GTA is under a special weather statement tonight as precipitation continues. What has been a rainy day is expected to change to snow as the evening progresses. They can't do the procedure. The x-ray machines are down. Everything's down. It's a computer. University Health Network says their systems are now back online after a, a computer and communication network crash led to delays and cancellations for patients. UHN says it's still working to determine what caused the outage. Officials in Taiwan are still trying to assess the damage after a major quake hit the island early this morning. The 7.2 magnitude earthquake was the strongest to hit there in a quarter century. Remember to keep up today, day and night through our website, ctvnewstoronto.ca, and by downloading the CTV News app. And if you ever have a news tip, photos, or video of breaking news, let us know. Indigo will no longer be a publicly traded company after agreeing to a buyout from a top shareholder. Amber Canwar from BNM Bloomberg has the latest in business. Indigo Books and Music agreed to be taken private after receiving a takeover offer from its largest investor. A holding company controlled by Jerry Schwartz offered to buy the company in February and then boosted the offer before it was accepted. Schwartz is the spouse of Indigo Chief Executive Heather Reisman and he already owns a majority of the shares. It marks the end of a tumultuous time as a public stock. The peak in the shares were in the late 1990s, around the time that Amazon started selling books online. The federal government is pledging more money for apartment construction and announced a $15 billion top-up to the federal loan program. This comes just one day after announcing a new $6 billion infrastructure fund for housing. These pledges are being made ahead of the federal budget in a few weeks and aim to address the supply crunch in Canada's housing market. 
Minister of Housing and former Immigration Minister Sean Fraser told me today that there will be additional measures to boost affordability in the housing market in the coming weeks. Shares of TSX-listed engineering and consulting firm WSP Global were the worst performing stock on the TSX today. A New York-based short seller released a critical report on the company. Spruce Point alleges that the Quebec-based WSP embellished its underlying performance and says that the shares are overvalued by as much as 50%. Now let's take a look at some of the closing market numbers. The Canadian dollar was up only modestly to just under 74 cents U.S., while U.S. oil prices advanced to a five-month high above $85 per barrel. Canadian oil prices also moved up to around $72 per barrel, and it was an update on the TSX, adding nearly 38 points. That's the latest in business. I'm Amber Canwar in the BNN Bloomberg Newsroom. The Business Report is brought to you by Canadian Western Bank, the bank built for business. Disney has successfully fended off a major investor who tried to secure board seats at the company in a challenge to the current leadership. Activist investor Nelson Peltz said he was unhappy with a number of recent box office flops and sought to shake up the entertainment giant. Disney says its preferred board, including CEO Bob Iger, will remain intact. After shareholders had their say, about 75 percent voted in favor of the status quo. As streaming services hike subscription fees, Spotify signaling plans to up the price for the second time in less than a year. Bloomberg reports the music service will raise prices in several markets, including the U.S. Canada wasn't specifically mentioned, but last year prices for the premium plan went up a dollar a month. The report linked the new increase to Spotify's edition of audiobooks. It suggested a new basic tier could be added at a lower price point. Reports tonight, former Toronto Raptor Vince Carter has been elected to the Basketball Hall of Fame. The now 47-year-old spent the first seven seasons of his career with the Raptors, helping put the franchise on the map during those early days. Carter played a record-setting 22 seasons in the NBA, making the All-Star team eight times. He also won a gold medal with Team USA at the Sydney Olympics back in 2000. After Toronto, Carter played in New Jersey, Orlando, Phoenix, Dallas, Memphis, Sacramento and Atlanta. It's expected the official announcement will come Saturday during the NCAA Final Four semifinal games. The Toronto Maple Leafs will be looking to extend their winning streak when they host Tampa Bay tonight. Toronto beat the Florida Panthers Monday for their third straight victory. The Buds are six points ahead of the Lightning, who hold the first wild card spot right now. Leafs defenseman Morgan Riley returns after missing four games with an upper body injury. March Madness ticket prices have surged after Caitlin Clark and Iowa beat LSU to move on to the Final Four. <laughs> The most expensive secondary market ticket for Friday's games are more than $11,000, and the cheapest tickets jumped 118% after Iowa's victory. The average price for an all-day session of the Final Four was more than $2,600 as of yesterday. Those prices are according to Ticket IQ. Just ahead, as far as lottery prizes go, it's a big one. The Powerball jackpot balloons beyond a billion dollars. The big draw tonight causing a frenzy below the border. Tonight, the desperate search for survivors in Taiwan. The terrifying place to be immediately after an earthquake. Hundreds are missing in the aftermath of a deadly earthquake later on CTV National News. And a reminder, the CTV News at 6 podcast is available as a download every weeknight. And a special shout out to those of you listening to the newscast live on News Talk 1010. Get Toronto's top stories, breaking news alerts, and watch live. Download the CTV News app. Could this finally be the night? A jackpot worth more than $1 billion is still up for grabs in the United States. The Powerball jackpot ranks as the ninth largest ever south of the border, and it has been growing for more than three months. And that may not be a surprise, considering the odds of winning this one are 1 in 292 million. There have been 39 draws since the jackpot was last won back on January 1st, but thousands of people in the meantime have won smaller prizes, but oh, the big one. I mean, all your dreams could come true.
It would be nice. That's for that weather jackpot. We're missing it. <laughs> there's a chance you could win that jackpot, but there's not a zero chance that the active weather ends as we head through the evening. It just transitions over to different active weather. We're looking at mixing taking place as we head kind of through right about now into the early evening, and then it carries us into our day tomorrow. We're not looking at a significant accumulation, but that doesn't matter when it comes to driving conditions. It will still be a challenge as we head throughout the day, and we're not really seeing a reprieve until we get into the afternoon tomorrow. Still under that special weather statement right now, Nothing is really changing, although we could see a lot of those start to lift into the day tomorrow. Still relatively mild. We're sitting at about four degrees here in the city, still warm through Windsor and London. Heading in towards the day tomorrow, we see a significant drop. We dip below seasonal for the high and the low. The mixing happens, but then we're starting to see it kind of get more sporadic. And by the time we get to the end of the day Friday, it's not so bad. Mm -mm, those double digit temperatures next week look wonderful. Thank you, Jess. That's it for us, but be sure to join Heather Butts tonight at 11 for CTV National News followed by Zoraida Ullman with our next local newscast at 11.30. In the meantime, our coverage continues anytime on CP24 and online at ctvnewstoronto.ca. For Jessica Smith and all of us here at CTV News, thank you for watching and have a great night.